So, good afternoon. Uh, uh, welcome to the second uh, MRF St. Stephen's Distinguished Alumni Lecture. Uh, the purpose of this lecture was to really uh, showcase what we Stephenians are capable of. And I, I sincerely hope that for those of you here, after listening to our uh, speaker today, uh, it gives you confidence to really re reach for the stars, right? And um, I must thank uh, Professor John Varghis for encouraging us to uh, endow this lecture. Uh, I consider it a great privilege to introduce our speaker this year, Mr. Piyush Gupta. Uh, Piyush is a perfect example of a Stephanian who, who has reached for the stars. Uh, after completing his economics in St. Stephen's, uh, just to clarify, he wasn't in res, so he's not so cool. He's a, he's a base scholar. Uh, uh, he, he finished his MBA at IIM Ahmedabad and then embarked on a remarkable journey in banking. Right? Uh, his first stop was Citibank, where he ended up being the CEO of Southeast Asia, Australia, and New Zealand. After that, he went to DBS as CEO. And under his leadership, DBS has been voted the best bank in the world by several institutions and also the best, the best digital bank, right? And uh, uh, they say this is, an, this is the era of the global Indian CEO. A lot of great companies in the world are led by leaders of Indian origin, whether it's um, uh, Microsoft, Google, Starbucks, FedEx, the list is long. And I, true belie I truly believe that Piyush is uh, up there with the best. And for me personally as well, uh, you know, our company works very closely with DBS as a, as a corporate bank. And we have a first-hand experience of the extremely customer-focused institution he has uh, developed. And uh, what makes me the most proud is that when I go to Singapore and talk to people there, is the enormous respect they have for Piyush, right? And whether it is uh, people in, in the industry, whether it's people in government, they have such a high regard for him. And the fact that he's in so many government advisory boards and the government of Singapore has given him the, 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 the most prestigious award is a testament to the respect they have for him. And uh, whenever I hear somebody praise Piyush, I'm always quick to say that he's from my college. Right? Uh, and the other interesting part of Piyush is that he's the fulcrum of uh, the Stephanian activity in Singapore. It's a very active alumni there. And uh, from what I heard, he always ensures he's there for most events. And for a lot of the young Stephanians, the incentive to go for these, for, for these events is to really hang out with, uh, uh, hang out with Piyush. Right? So uh, Piyush, thank you very much for speaking to us here today. I would like to end by saying that we are so incredibly proud of what you achieved and uh, wish you all the very best in the future. Uh, students, uh, alumni, uh, staff, everybody present here, ladies and gentlemen, you know, after that uh, a fantastic introduction, I almost can't wait to hear myself speak. Um, it's a real honor to be speaking at this August event uh, on the heels of uh, the inaugural lecture done by um, the Honorable uh, Minister Jay Shankar last year. Um, I have to thank uh, Rahul Samir, uh, the MRF, uh, folks for sponsoring uh, with this endowment, this fantastic uh, opportunity uh, to be able to showcase a lot of people who have uh, gone through these hallowed halls and uh, made something of themselves. Uh, hopefully it's an inspiration to many of the current students and people um, uh, of current batches uh, over here. I have to say um, it's a real pleasure also to be able to look at this hall from this vantage point. Uh, I was one of those who only saw the backs of chairs while I was here. And I have to say that the front of chairs look a lot more elegant than the backs did, unless it's a trick of the mind. Um, I was here in the late 70s, 77 to 80, and I have been a banker now for 40 odd years. Uh, I wish I could say that uh, my banking career was uh, developed on the back of the money and banking course in the second year at uh, economics. Uh, unfortunately, that wasn't true. Like most people in my cohort, I aspired to uh, join the civil service, the foreign service, really. Um, but in those days, uh, you needed to get another year of education before you were permitted to take the civil service exam. 
So I went off and did an MBA in the meantime. Uh, fast forward, I cleared the UPSC, but did not get a rank good enough to join the Foreign Service, which is what I wanted to do. And in the meantime, I got seduced by the glamour of a multinational bank, which uh, promised to send you overseas for training and then let you see the world. And so I went off there. I have to admit, I was never a finance type. Uh, just like, uh, you know, you talked about, I was never a risk type or a science type. I was not a finance type. In fact, I believe the only reason I got a, um, a job with, uh, with that company was uh, when they really pushed me hard uh, and kept asking why they should give me a job, I finally had no recourse and said, well, you don't have a choice. I'm a banya, and banya are the money lenders. So in, to uphold the tradition of caste in India, you'd better give me a job. So the only reason I managed to get a banking job. Now I say this because uh, I want to make a point. Um, it's a long segue. Uh, but a lot of people think banking is mostly about finance. And in truth, that is um, far from being the case. Of course, the elements of finance. Uh, but I, I took to banking and I enjoyed my entire career in banking, principally because banking is a fantastic general management discipline. Uh, you need common sense, you need people skills, you need the ability to think strategically, look around corners. Uh, but most of all, increasingly in, real, in, in recent times, uh, you need to have a facility with technology. Uh, banking today is increasingly more and more all about technology. So in the course of my lecture today, um, you know, I hope to give you a sense for both the eclectic nature of banking. Uh, I will talk a little bit about you know, regulations, rules, and what the banking industry is today. Uh, but mostly, uh, where are we going? He, he did this payment thing famously at the turn of the century in Tahiti. Mm -hmm. Uh, he explores fundamental questions relating to the nature and meaning of life. Uh, as we stand at the cusp of a historic moment in banking today, with rapid shifts in the landscape calling into question the very existence of banks, uh, it is fitting to reflect on the questions posed as they relate to banks, including the history, the identity, and the destiny. Where do we come from? I first begin with the impact of regulation on banking over the last 20 odd years, uh, really from the century, but most profoundly after the 2007-2009 financial crisis. Where, uh, what are we? I then turn to how technological advancements have transformed the mix of players and the flow of money in profound ways and what it means to be a bank. And finally, in where are we going? I will consider the future of banking, what it could look like, including the potential for the blockchain to transform finance as we know it today. In reflecting on these, I aim to address some fundamental and existential questions, such as what is the role of a bank? Who is a bank? And uh, importantly, do we still need banks? So let me start first um, with the fundamentals. Uh, what are the functions of a bank? And I'm going to try and keep this um, seated as well. But I define the function of a bank uh, in four key steps. Number one, uh, banks intermediate risk. What does that mean? They're savers who want to put money to work. They're people who need to borrow money. Savers generally do not know who is credit worthy and who is not. And so banks sit in the middle and they make the distinction between credit worthy and non credit worthy opportunities. So, the intermediate risk. Banks intermediate time. Uh, what does that mean? Most savers want to keep money for the short term. They need to have liquidity because the needs are day to day needs. Whereas companies, corporations, and users of money, individuals, have a need for money early in their lives and careers. And they wind up having savings from investments much, and that makes them probably the most leveraged institutions in the system. This leverage is critical because this is how money gets created. Yet all of these functions that are core to banking, the ones I spoke about, also have in them the seeds of the banking system's own weakness. Uh, because each of these, the ability to transform risk, the ability to transform time, the ability to create money, each of these in balance is a good function. Uh, creating money is a good function. It helps lubricate the wheels of the economy and it helps the economic system grow. But in excess, every one of these functions of a bank has got the seed of financial distress and financial instability. So too much uh, liquidity transformation leaves a bank subject to deposit flights or runs. 
Too much leverage means that the bank has inadequate capital to be able to absorb unexpected risks. This need for balance between the innate function of banks and being able to manage systemic risk uh, has been one of the biggest challenges over the last two, three hundred years ever since banks have existed. Getting the right balance is a complex task and the consequences of getting it wrong are grave as exemplified by the fall of uh, Lehman Brothers. Today, the term a Lehman moment has entered the financial lexicon to mean the moment when a company's problems or one seemingly small part of the system becomes so large that it becomes everyone's problem. So what exactly happened during this Lehman moment? Now, it's not really germane to the key points I'm making, but it's interesting to get a sense for the drama. And I was there at the time of the drama. It was one of the most dramatic uh, few days in my banking career. Uh, the lead up to Lehman's collapse was characterized by uh, frenzied hour negotiations, 11th hour negotiations. Uh, even down to the wire, everyone believed Lehman Brothers would never be allowed to fail and would be rescued somehow. After all, Bear Stearns, a smaller investment bank, had been bailed out just six months earlier by regulators and J.P. Morgan Chase. On Wednesday, the 10th of September 2008, South Korea's uh, Korean Development Bank said it was no longer in the race to rescue Lehman Brothers. Along with Lehman's announcement of a $3.9 billion quarterly loss, this led to a 45% crash in the bank's shares on that day. Following this, Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson called Bank of America CEO Ken Lewis to ask him to put on his imagination hat to find a creative way to buy uh, Lehman Brothers. By Friday, um, two days later, Bank of America refused. They said they were unable to serve um, uh, to save Lehman Brothers unless the government was uh, willing to step in and help. Uh, this did not come to the pass. Come to pass. So the U.S. government chose not to conduct another politically unpopular bailout. Similarly, the British government discouraged Barclays uh, from buying Lehman Brothers in view of uh, its own mountains of troubled debt. As a consequence, at 1.45 a.m. on Monday, the 15th of September, now note, this is just four days later, Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy. With $600 billion in debt, putting 26,000 of the firm's employees worldwide out of work and triggering a dive in the economy. The Dow plunged 500 odd points which at the time marked its biggest one-day point drop since 9-11. Almost $700 billion disappeared from retirement plans and other investment funds. The U.S. economy entered a severe downturn in what is now called the Great Recession. So, I mean, like I said, it's not germane to the key thing, but I wanted to point out to you that all of this thing happened in four days. And therefore, the point really that the regulators took home from this is the weaknesses and vulnerabilities in the banking system that uh, need to be addressed. So if you go back to this thing, what caused the problem with Lehman Brothers, it was the same three things. Number one, it was a problem of leverage. Uh, there'd been a dramatic buildup of leverage over the years, amplified, uh, which amplified the weakness inherent to banks. Uh, leverage had built up significantly, and between 2000 and 2007 alone, Lehman's leverage had surged to 40 is to one. So I talked about 10 to 12 times being normal leverage. The second big issue was the issue of risk. Banks and other financial players in the United States and globally borrowed large amounts to boost loans and purchase packaged uh, mortgage-backed securities, which were pools of mortgages that were packaged and sold to customers. They also purchased collateralized debt obligations uh, backed by risky subprime mortgages. The risk levels of all of these types of securities were high, but they took reassurance from the positive assessment uh, approved by uh, rating agencies who rated many of these products as AA and AAA. Uh, as a result, the true nature of risk was misrepresented. So there was a leverage problem, there was a risk problem. And finally, there was a liquidity problem. Because a lot of the purchases that the banks made uh, were done with short-term funds and short-term funding. Uh, CDO sales rose almost tenfold from 30 billion in 2003 to 225 billion in 2006. The high degree of leverage in the liquidity mismatches resulted in significant losses to banks and investors when house prices started falling precipitously. So we go back to the problems, the same problems, leverage, liquidity, 
and uh, mismanagement of the risk profile. So in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, uh, financial regulation underwent a major overhaul as regulators took measures to shore up capital and liquidity and strengthen the oversight of banks and other financial institutions. Regulations such as the US's Dodd-Frank uh, Wall Street Reform Act and Basel III reforms aimed to tighten financial industry regulation by mandating higher capital reserve requirements and boosting liquidity requirements to reduce reliance on volatile short-term funding. As a result, banks today are much better capitalized. They have much more liquidity and are much more securely funded than before the crisis. Credit agencies are also better regulated to ensure that ratings accurately reflect the true level of risk. So by and large, the regulatory reforms have been beneficial. Well, there have been some exceptions you saw last year. There were exceptions of regional banks in the US. There were exceptions with banks such as Credit Suisse. The causes of these failures were related not to regulatory weaknesses in and of themselves, but rather poor risk management practices and lack of trust by customers and investors. So the banking system between 2008-9 and 2020 has ostensibly become safer, sturdier, uh, and a lot more stable. Regulatory reform has not ended. It's been, not, uh, it's been on a roll for the last 15 years. But by and large, the bulk of what was required to make the regulated system safe has already come to pass. However, while regulatory reforms are sought to bring back, banks back to sensible levels of capital, liquidity, and risk requirements, uh, they have resulted in financing activity and risk shifting from the regulated banking sector to the non-regulated banking sector. This is the challenge. And then the risk is like a balloon. If you squeeze one side of the balloon, risk just moves to another unregulated part of the system. And this is actually what has happened over the last 10, 15 years. According to Financial Stability Board, the total assets of the non-bank financial sector increased to 239 trillion at the end of 2021 from about 100 trillion at the time of the global financial crisis. And it now accounts for almost 50% of total global financial assets. Now in this, I include all intermediated assets. So mutual and hedge funds, private equity, private debt, other shadow banking, uh, P2P firms, technology companies. Uh, many of these new players do bring significant value. They bring value because they bring a new way of intermediating uh, money and finance, but also because they often bring a new source of funding, uh, stable longer term funding, more committed funding, and a different risk appetite. But, and there's always a but, it has come with a lot of unintended consequences. So first, even though most people believe that liquidity risk is less, in some of these um, shadow banks, mutual funds, for example, hedge funds, because people keep their money long term. They're not savers and depositors who want to bring, take the money out quickly. In reality, it doesn't always come to pass in this way. Through COVID, it was quite clear that a lot of people uh, did early redemptions. So a lot of mutual funds and hedge funds saw an outflow of money. Uh, as a consequence, many of these funds had to shut down. And therefore, the liquidity challenge continues to be in place, other than some specific private equity funds, which are very, really committed long-term funding. Uh, second, when it comes to shadow banks, um, in China, over a period of time, there were over 5,000 P2P companies which got created. So individuals effectively are companies providing finance to other individuals and other companies. Over time, many of these companies failed because the P2P uh, lenders did not have oversight. Many of them were scams. And even the ones that were not scams did not have a good way of assessing and intermediating risk. Eventually, the Chinese wound up shutting almost 90% of these P2P firms. Uh, it is not just in China and Europe. Financial centers such as Ireland and Luxembourg, the assets of shadow banks, and particularly pension funds and insurers, have expanded 8 to 10% annually, year after year. So it's a large pool of relatively unregulated money. And because it's unregulated, some of it does uh, pose a new form of risk. The private credit markets have been growing. So 20 years ago, if any company wanted equity, 
the most obvious place to go was the public markets. So you did an IPO and raised public money. Uh, but in the last 20 years, the biggest source of private capital has actually been private equity and the private markets. It's easy to access, the large pools of the money, and comes with less disclosure requirements and less regulatory hurdles than uh, public money does. Uh, similarly, in more recent times, there's been the growth of private debt, which means that companies are now going not to banks to borrow money, but to other funds to borrow money. The size of this private debt industry in the US alone is about one and a half trillion dollars. In Asia, it's smaller, it's about a hundred billion dollars, but continuing to grow exponentially. Finally, uh, even in the regulated sector, uh, you saw that some of the regulatory uh, agenda in the last 15 years has indeed led to unintended consequences. Uh, one significant example of this is in the safest, what is traditionally known to be the safest markets, which are the government bond markets and the treasuries markets. Uh, the use and buildup of leverage by unregulated entities have the potential to wreak uh, uh, havoc even in these markets. The UK guilt crisis of two or three years ago and the buildup in the hedge fund bets against US treasuries show how the combination of inadequate market liquidity caused by some of the new regulations with abrupt and unexpected market movements and the speed with which it might occur can result in potentially significant consequences. A year and a half ago, a panic in the UK gilts market triggered a crisis of confidence in the government and forced the Bank of England into an emergency rescue. In less than three days in September 2022, 30-year UK gilt yields rose one by more than 1.6% following a list trust's mini budget. Um, UK defined the benefit pension schemes which tend to base the liquidity management on a 1% increase in bond yields over a week or more, were caught off guard. And uh, the speed and the extent of this increase uh, caused them to be unable to get the collateral that they needed to service margin calls. In just one day, the intraday range of 127 basis points on the 30-year guild exceeded the annual range in 23 out of the last 27 years. So, this is an unintended consequence. The absence of liquidity in the incumbent banking system and the leverage in the new banking system still creates, creates a huge amount of volatility in what is supposed to be a regulated banking market. And finally, my last comment on this, even in the regulated sector, because of the nature of regulations in the last 15, 20 years, there are some areas of the economy which do need a lot of financing, small and medium enterprises, project finance, infrastructure finance, increasingly sustainable and green finance. The regulatory environment today makes it difficult for the formal system, the incumbent system, to actually finance many of these activities. So the point I want to make in this, where are we coming from, is when I started banking in the 1980s, it was a different world. It was mostly dominated by large players, large global banks, and most of the sector was regulated. If there are two points I would like you to take away from uh, this first uh, part of my talk, it is this. That world has changed. The formal regulated world is now less than half of the system. It's a much smaller part of the system. It might be safer in some ways, but it is just much smaller. And in a relative sense, the largest part of the financial system is outside of the purview of regulations. And it is the financial markets, the equity markets, the private equity, private capital debt, and in that lies a whole um, challenge of unforeseen and unknown risk. The second uh, point is really therefore to do with that, that the nature of risk within the regulated system is probably lower, but overall financial sector stability, the nature of what is going on in the system is as challenged as it was. And increasingly, uh, there's no supra agencies that have oversight over the entire system and all of the players at any single point in time. So, where are we coming from? An industry that has morphed, which is a lot more players, very different kinds of players, and different kinds of risks which are hidden today from public eye. Let me move on uh, to uh, the second part of my uh, comments, where are we? And here I'm going to focus a little bit less on the regulatory environment and the nature of players. I'm going to shift the focus a little bit to the nature of digitization and technology. Uh, I think it's quite clear to all of us that all of our lives are completely digital. 
well, not completely, but massively digital. Uh, more and more of us are spending time in the digital domain. And this is true in respect of everything we do, whether it's a shopping or buying a ticket or going to a movie or even just entertainment news, what have you. The fact that more and more of our lives in the digital domain is in the digital domain has some profound consequences for the world of finance and the nature of finance. Apart from the fact that we get more used to doing things digitally, uh, we get more used to our providers being digitally present for us, uh, which means that you expect your banks and your banking system to be able to do much the same. Uh, what also happens is that the bar on expectations changes dramatically. And the bar on expectations is quite simple, that you get used to the kind of service that Google can give you. In Google, you're used to instantaneous response. You go to any online platform, you want to be able to get convenience on your, at your fingertips in real time 24-7. Well, people change their expectation set and now expect the banks and the financial services providers to also be able to do much the same. In fact, if I can do that for my e-commerce transactions, then why can I not do it for my banking transactions? And this change and lift in the expectations bar is very consequential to banks and the nature of banking. A third thing that um, changes um, is personalized experience. By and large, people have now got to the realm and to the day where you want to personalize an experience to you. It is not a mass market experience anymore. It is not a standard product. You want um, Netflix to choose the right movie for you or Amazon to choose the right product for you. Again, this transfers to the financial services world. So the expectations of banks changes, the need and requirement for personalized services changes, and just always on 24-7 at my fingertips in real time, that becomes the new expectation set. As consumers spend increasing amounts of time in the digital world, all of these expectations change, and um, you have to start thinking about as a bank, how you going to adjust to this new paradigm. So I had the fortune of, um, in 2013, I had a meeting and ran into Jack Ma. Jack Ma is the you know, well-known uh, founder of the Alibaba group. And in talking to him that day, I had um, an extraordinary epiphany. We had breakfast. I realized at the end of breakfast that this man and what he's seeking to do is going to fundamentally change the nature of the world I'd grown up in, the world of banking. He was already raising money digitally. He was lending digitally. Uh, he was using data to underwrite. He had the world's largest money market mutual fund, your bow, all digital. He was beginning to do insurance digitally. It was, in effect, a bank. It just didn't call itself a bank. I remember going and meeting the regulator a year or two later in China and Shanghai and asked them, you know, if it talks like a duck and walks like a duck, it's a bank. Why won't you regulate it? And the regulator told me, well, you know, Earlier it was too small, now it's too big. We don't know how to regulate it. Of course, it's changed in recent times. But uh, this epiphany that the nature of our industry would change like every other digital provider, uh, that caused us in DBS to embrace this vision of a complete transformation, a digital transformation in the banking model that we were able to do and provide. So what did we do? Um, we focused very hard on what we thought of and defined as the big tech model. And we broke it down into five things. Uh, the first thing we said is customer acquisition needs to be totally different. In banking, for all of us, our customer acquisition uh, historically had been built on a branch system. You open branches so that you could go and get customers from around the neighborhood or the vicinity. And then as you got into the 80s and 90s, you overlaid that with feet on street which is you sent a lot of young kids with flyers to go to the shopping malls and thrust credit cards into the faces of customers. But when you reflect on big tech, you don't see any office, you don't see any branch, Facebook doesn't have an entity, and you've never seen a salesperson from any big technology company coming to your door knocking, trying to offer products. So big technology had mastered the art of getting customers digitally cheaper. Which means you've got to go and say, how do I authenticate if I don't have a signature? So very simplistic first principle thinking on redefining what it meant to be able to do seamless banking and do instant transactions. The third thing that we had to focus on and design for 
was uh, this notion of uh, contextual marketing. You know, how do you actually sell in context? Uh, as I said before, in banking, the whole uh, theory was a theory of cross-sell. What did that mean? Cost of customer acquisition is high. And therefore, once you get the customer, your job is to find how many products you can sell to the customer, push more products into the customer. But the big tech industry had found a different model. They had found a model I call cross-buy and not cross-sell. In the cross-buy model, they just made things so convenient and so contextual for the customer, the customer just automatically chose to do more and more. Amazon Prime was a great example. Amazon Prime made it so easy to buy stuff that people started buying one toothbrush, one toothpaste, or one hanky from Prime and getting it delivered to their house. Now, which means that banks had to change our model from a cross-sell model to a cross-buy model. And what that meant was that we needed to be in context all the time. What does that mean? It meant what I started calling invisible banking, or the world started calling embedded finance. The idea that what people really want to do in their lives is not bank. They don't wake up in the morning saying, I want to go to a bank. They want to buy a car. They want to go eat a meal. They want to go uh, purchase a home. You need to take your banking products and hide them into the digital activities that the customer really wants to do. And therefore, your product should be like Intel inside hidden inside the fabric of a customer's real needs and real requirements. And that is the nature of embedded finance. The rise of embedded finance has allowed both financial and non-financial players to integrate financial services into non-financial offerings to serve customers contextually. This includes e-commerce retailers, includes marketplace offerings, uh, bank services, financing services, third-party banking as a service solutions, all of that is a part of uh, what is called embedded finance. Banks have uh, today embedded their own solutions into the platforms and ecosystem value chains of partners. By doing this, fundamentally, they can also access large pools of customers at a much cheaper cost. Uh, they collaborate to acquire customers digitally to co-create solutions that can meet the needs of these customers and increase engagement with them where they live, work, and play. For instance, Stripe is a payments company in the US. It has partnered with Goldman Sachs and other banks to offer embedded finance to platform and third-party marketplaces. In DBS, what we do is uh, several ways of embedding our finance. We have engaged in platform partnerships with integrated digital and supply chain financing capabilities to enable SMEs across Asia uh, to access funding more seamlessly. In markets such as China, Indonesia, India, we offer our lending solutions, our payment solutions, uh, FX solutions, and we do it by plugging into these marketplaces, into the supply chains of these big companies. So we are really hidden behind what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we partner with companies like ByteDance and Ctrip in China. We partner with companies such as Home Credit and Credivo in countries like Indi Indonesia and India. In addition, what banks started doing is building their own ecosystems, apart from participating in other people's ecosystems, they started building their own ecosystems uh, to embed themselves in customers' lives. One of the first examples of this that we did at DBS was really in the context of the home buying journey. Now imagine how home buying works. You decide to buy a home, you either select a location, you have a budget, but most often you start talking to a broker. Brokers help you go find a host, you, you start looking for houses. Once you finalize your home is when you approach the bank to start looking for a mortgage. In the process, what happens is the mortgage becomes a very commoditized business. Because at this stage, you've already made all your choices, and all you're looking for is who can give you the highest loan for the cheapest price. Imagine if the bank could engage and embed themselves in the journey six months ahead of time, help you look for the home, help you find the location, tell you about that home. So we created, embedded a system for home buying uh, in Singapore where you can go scan any property, we have tied and linked in to all the Urban Redevelopment Authority data. It tells you everything about the property, what price it was sold at last, what mortgage it was sold at, uh, every financial metric on the property. But it also tells you which is the nearest MRT, what you can buy, what other people have sold for. So you start engaging with the customer six months ahead in the home buying journey. So that's a great example of embedding. Another example of what we've been able to do in Singapore is a platform we call Pela. It's a payment platform. We started it as a digital wallet, as a payment platform. 
but increasingly we expanded it to be a complete ecosystem. So today, out of the 5 million odd people in Singapore, 3.5 million people have downloaded Pela, 3 million use it regularly. And they use it for things like buying the movie tickets, for hailing a cab, to do a restaurant booking, to pay any of their bills, to pay P2P and do a whole bunch of different stuff. So these 3 million people who are coming to the Pela platform regularly, they're doing it not just because there's a banking activity, but because we have embedded ourselves in their daily life, in everything that they want to do. So these examples of what a bank needs to do to embed itself, to make itself invisible, are profound in the nature of understanding what is the role of a bank and what can a bank do very differently as you go forward. Finally, uh, in recent years, this notion of digitizing and being able to create convenience for customers started taking even more important uh, measures. One, you have to start focusing on UI and UX, so user interface and user experience. So what did we do? Um, we went and created a design team. Today, our design team is 150 people. It is, and we have people from IDEO, from Apple, from some of the best design companies in the world. In the design team, we have anthropologists, ethnographers, whose job it is to help us understand the deep emotional insights to what customers do and why they do what they do. Uh, and by using these deep insights, using anthropologists and even uh, um, um, doing deep observation, both online and offline observation, it gives us the capacity to be able to design things very, very differently. If you'd asked me when I started my banking career that banks would employ anthropologists or ethnographers, um, I would have laughed and fallen off my chest. That's not what banks did. But today, banks do do that. So design, anthropology, ethnography, and these are things that banks have evolved to and the nature of the banking discipline um, uh, needs. So I think three, four years ago, um, we got hit by a brave new world, the world of AI. And in point of fact, at DBS, we were involved with this uh, from 2013. IBM launched something it called Watson. And Watson became famous because it was the first computer which was able to win uh, global chess. Uh, so we worked with IBM in 2013 to be the global pilot for applying Watson to wealth management. Um, we worked on it for a couple of years. It was not successful because natural language processing and the way AI functioned had not evolved adequately at that time. It could not read graphs, it could not read bar charts, it could not read pictorials. So we tried a couple of more times. In 2015, we created some AI labs with the ASTAR, the Singapore uh, uh, AI agency. In 2016-17, we acquired a small stake in an AI company in the US, and we created chatbots for servicing. Um, but in, it was only in the last three or four years that we finally mastered how to use artificial intelligence in banking. To do that, the most important thing you have to focus on is actually data. The, the mystery and the trick behind any artificial intelligence is access to data. And we spent a long time, built data factories, created large numbers of people to migrate data all into central data lakes, to create a taxonomy around data, to create metadata which allows us to identify data, to create the rules of data ownership and data access, uh, figure what data is okay to use and not okay to use. At the same time, we focused on building the AI models. So we hired data scientists and data analysts and built a whole team of people who can do uh, regression, neural engineering, a whole bunch of advanced tools to try and make method uh, and create AI tools which can self do it. This is not predictive AI. Uh, by last year, we now have about 800 uh, AI models. We have about 1,000 people doing AI models, rules, and data engineering. Um, of the 1,000 people, we've been able to create 800 models. We have about 400 use cases. Now, the variety of these use cases is mind-boggling. So today, we use AI to hire people. We don't hire by just looking at your CV or to look at seeing where, which call, whether you went to Stephen's or not, uh, or what grade you got. So AI determines based on your skill set and prototype of the job, whether you're ideally suited for the job or not. It does the first round of interviewing of all 80,000 people who apply for the jobs that we want. We use AI to move people around. AI determines what skills you need and what are the jobs we can give you. We use AI to be able to handle calls. All our calls that come in into our contact centers, AI determines whether this person is angry or sad and who should see this call. AI creates chatbots, so 90% of all our calls are now handled by voice, by chatbot, 
which understands the call, translates the call, and then responds to the call in real time. It does our marketing, it does our risk management, it does our compliance, it does our finance, it does our prediction of cash flow. All of these are use cases which are AI done. So the nature of what it means to do real work is beginning to change. Because all of these activities are activities we expected people to do. But increasingly, the computer does these activities. So you've got to reimagine and say, okay, then what does the human being do if the computer is going to do all of these kinds of activities? Now, this problem um, got exaggerated and exacerbated many fold 18 months ago. And that's when uh, generative AI and chat GPT came along. Uh, what chat GPT does, or generative AI does, it takes the old problem I had, which is natural language processing is not good enough, and reading of unstructured data is not good enough, and it turns it on its head. Today, chat GPT or any of the large models can read and understand language, and increasingly in every language, English, Hindi, Bahasa, Chinese, they understand uh, voice, they can transcribe it to text, they can respond in real time uh, in very intelligent ways, and they can create output. It can create visual output, it can create movie output, it can create out audio output. So it does all of these things uh, in fantastic ways which you'd never have been able to do in the past. So what does that mean? Uh, it means that you can actually take all of the AI models that we've been running and improve those models substantially. Because you can now add not just structured data but unstructured data to create a response. It means that your AI is no longer just predictive. It is generative. It not only predicts stuff, it can actually generate ideas and generate stuff. So one great use case that we've been uh, with the last two, three years is in financial planning and wealth management. So we've been able to, in the last few years, uh, we stitched up a lot of data sources in Singapore, your health records, the government of CPF pension fund records, uh, your banking sector records, your know, insurance records. And as long as you want to bring all your records together, you punch a button and all the records come together, you get a complete balance sheet of the individual. On top of that, we layer AI to be able to give you advice on what you should do. AI decides what your budget should be. So it tells you reduce a budget on dining, increase your budget on you know, travel. But net net AI helps you convert from being cash deficit to cash positive. Then AI further gives you advice saying now that you're cash positive, I suggest that you can go and buy the following low risk funds or the following regular savings plans to be able to put your money to work. So we call it a financial needs analysis and, an, and, a, and a financial planner. With Gen AI, you can take this to a completely different level because now the inputs you give it are a lot more diverse. But more important, the nudges that you give the customer, we call the next best nudge, are a lot more refined and a lot more thoughtful. So last year, we started working on use cases for Gen AI. We are today running about 20 use cases for Gen AI. But by and large, they focus on three or four broad areas of opportunity. One is uh, driving productivity and efficiency gains by reducing toil in the nature of work. I spoke briefly about the nature of work is changing. This is really going to happen with Gen AI. A lot of the stuff that you needed white collar workers for, I talk about call centers, I call anything that needs reading, synthesis, writing, and output, all of that can change. Um, Goldman Sachs uh, wrote a report recently which said 30 to 50 percent of all jobs will change because of Gen AI. We can see today that we are applying it to our call center and by the end of this year we will get at least a 20 percent productivity lift in our call centers. We are applying it to software development. This is to me the biggest shock. Two years ago if you asked anybody which is the best career they'd say learn coding, learn Python, learn software development. We have 6,000 developers in the company. Fast forward a year from now, you'll have 30% productivity left. You will not need so many coders because Gen AI does the coding better than the kids do the coding. So productivity is going to be a big opportunity. The second is there's a much more better opportunity to create customer engagement uh, and new customer propositions. And finally, we think that there's an opportunity to create a positive impact to our fundamental business model itself by potentially opening completely new segments and completely new markets. One of the things that we've done to facilitate and aid this process in the last year or so is we've created our own version of uh, Gen AI. We call it uh, uh, DBS GPT. Why do we do that? Because 
different large language models and different forms of GPT are good for different things. Also, you are con concerned about data privacy and data leakage. So what we've done is created our own guardrails. We actually let our people create a portal at the front end. They put in their stuff within the DBS GPT. At the back, we've linked into all of the large language models and GPTs and we put in a rules engine, which um, unbeknown, unbeknownst to the user, just picks up the right model and the right GPT for them to use and allows them to do the job in a very different way than they're doing right now. Our expectation is that all 40,000 of our people by the end of June will have this tool, this capability to use DBS GPT as what is called a co-pilot. So every individual is going to have a parallel worker, a virtual ghost worker sitting next to them. So they will do what they do and then their virtual partner is going to help them improve their work, reduce their toil, and improve the productivity in what they do. And this is not sometime in the future. This is in the second half of this year. It's not just the banks which have been doing a lot of stuff with technology and the world of technology. One of the biggest changes that you've seen in the sector and the industry is obviously uh, the change related to new players. So startups have been um, making hay in this brave new world. They started by unbundling the value chain of banking and in every part of the banking domain, trying to figure how you could do things better and do things uh, differently. And by and large, most startups were able to do that because our industry was quite inefficient and quite primitive in the way it approached things. Uh, but the problem really was that a lot of the startups also uh, benefited a lot from an environment of cheap money uh, and the capacity to be able to burn large amounts of money for long periods of time. In reality, some things were still fundamental to banking and did not change. One, it's not that easy to acquire customers digitally. The cost of acquisition is actually very high. Uh, second, it is very hard to monetize many of the customers that you bring in. We launched a pure digital bank in India in 2016. In 18 months, we were able to acquire 3 million customers. But when we reviewed it 18 months later, it was quite clear that 95% of those customers would never make money for us. Uh, they were good for getting eyeballs and they were good if you were in the valuation game based on number of customers. But if you're focused on making money or creating a true customer value proposition, uh, they left a lot uh, to be desired. So come COVID, uh, you had a crypto winter, you had a technology crash and freeze, and many startups wound up either failing or not being able to uh, scale. Nevertheless, uh, those that were able to focus on a true customer value proposition have indeed been able to create a worthwhile and scalable model. And fintech as a general rule continues to be a dominant area where funding is um, uh, going in. According to McKinsey, as of July of last year, publicly traded fintechs represented a market capitalization of $550 billion, uh, two times versus 2019. So even in the four years of COVID, market cap of these fintechs has gone up by half a trillion dollars. Um, in the same period, there were more than 272 fintech unicorns with a combined valuation of almost $936 billion, a seven-fold increase from the 39-odd firms before. So the point I want to make is that um, there have been new players. A lot of the new players don't succeed. The ones who succeed often are in the B2B space where they can work with incumbents. But if you have a sound model and you can create a customer value proposition that works, you can use the same tools, UI, UX, technology, AI, and data to really uh, create a distinctive proposition for customers. And that is still potentially a winning proposition. Now, moving on, you know, all of the digital banking has been fantastic. It's been great. It actually creates a lot of value for customers. But the truth is that it also creates say, a risk for the system, not dissimilar to what I spoke about earlier about uh, balance, the need for balance. Uh, the risk reward challenges, one, come from uh, the shift towards digital communications and the speed at which funds can be withdrawn and information be transferred. And uh, that massively changes the liquidity risk for bank, the risk for bank runs. If you take a look at Silicon Valley Bank um, a year or two ago. Um, Peter Thiel sent out a message at 9 in the morning, say he's concerned about the bank. By 9.30, all of his 35,000 closest friends were panicked. And within a day, the bank lost $46 billion. 
Now, this could not have happened in the world before digital. Um, first of all, it took a lot longer for fear and panic to spread. It took weeks often for fear and panic to spread. But more important, if you then wanted to go and pull your money out of the bank, you take a suitcase and go to the bank counters and face a two-mile long queue or go to the ATM. There was natural friction in respect of how quickly money could move. That friction is gone. So the pace of panic has increased and the capacity to be able to take money frictionless is gone. That creates a completely different perspective on liquidity risk in the system. Uh, there's also a fundamental difference in the context of cybercrime. As more and more money moves online, it becomes easier and easier for the criminals to be able to tap into that money. In point of fact, the risks are much higher in a manual world. Believe me, it's much easier for somebody to fake your signature than it is to break into your password. However, the difference is very subtle. If somebody copies a signature, they can take uh, money out one time. They take one check or one money transfer. If somebody can break into a digital apparatus, you can scale crime and fraud exponentially. And therefore, while it's harder to do, the rewards are much bigger. As a consequence, there's a much greater uh, proliferation of cybercrime, both from criminal syndicates around the world, but also from state actors around the world. Um, in addition to pure cybercrime of the normal nature, we are constantly facing, for example, ransomware attacks. Banks are subject to the greatest amount of ransomware attacks where people come, block your systems, and ask you to pay a ransom to open your systems again. Or even what are called denial of service attacks, where they just flood your systems with so much traffic that the normal consumer is unable to get in, a DDoS attack. Some of these are just to build a reputation. Some of it is just to create inconvenience. And some of it is just to hack into a bank systems uh, to see if they can do that and get away with that. But perhaps the biggest challenge is not just the challenge of uh, greater risk on liquidity or challenge of cyber scams and frauds. To me, one of the biggest challenges that we face, we face the humanity and society, is the challenge of uh, what is right and what is wrong. Uh, this use of data and use of AI is beginning to create some really profound questions on suitability and appropriateness. Uh, what is the right thing to do? What is private? What data should you use and what data should you not use? Where should you apply models and where is it not right to apply models? Unfortunately, these are not questions of STEM. These are not questions of science and technology. These are questions of morality and ethics. These are questions of philosophy. These are questions which define what makes us human beings, what defines us as a society, and what is the right thing to do. I want to make a reference again to the nature of the people behind banks. So I already told you, it's not just about finance. We have designers, we have technologists, we have data scientists, we have data engineers, and guess what? Now we need philosophers and we need people with moral compass and ethics who can help keep us on the right track. In DBS, uh, we've created a framework we call PURE. Um, it's a four-part uh, framework. PURE stands for purposeful, unsurprising, uh, respectful, and explainable. And our framework is quite clear that when we use data or we create an AI model or we create a Gen AI model, we take it to a responsible data use committee. And the intent of the committee is to apply the PURE principles and say, okay, is it okay for us to use this? Uh, would the customer normally expect us to use this? Can we hand on heart say that use of this is beneficial to the customer and not um, uh, uh, otherwise? So these principles are important and these principles need to be embraced by companies and corporations and banks as you go forward. Uh, but these are not easy because some of these are not black and white. These, there is a lot of gray. You think and consider the use of data. You know, the notion of privacy has changed dramatically over the years. 2,000 years ago, it was okay for men and women to bathe together in Roman public baths. Um, fast forward to the Victorian age, and you started having segregation of sexes. When Kodak invented the first camera, there was a big debate whether to take a public photograph was okay or not, anybody's photograph, or is it private data. When the Post and Telegraph Department got established, there was a big question mark on whether the postman is allowed to open a letter and read it. Now, all of these rules on privacy were not born, they got created over time. Today, the nature of privacy is very different. Old people think about privacy very differently from young people. People in the East think very differently about privacy from people in the West. Uh, by and large, in Asian cultures, 
if it is for the collective good, people are willing to share information and data. In Western cultures, irrespective of what, data is sacrosanct, is not shared. So there is no black and white. Frankly, there's no black and white even in ourselves. I often ask this trick question to audiences. Uh, would you like somebody to know where you are 24-7 of the day and pretty much everything you're doing? And by and large, everybody says, no, of course not. And then I say, okay, show me your mobile phone. And everybody has location on and everything, especially Google Maps. So you've already given up your location and you've done it because the value exchange was beneficial to you. You were getting convenience and you're happy to trade it off. So in this world, the niceties of what is right and what is wrong, how do you use data AI is going to be profoundly important. Uh, in addition to morality, there's another big question of trust. I'm convinced that the single biggest risk that we face as we go forward is the erosion of trust. Uh, it's because nobody knows what's real anymore. Uh, our entire society uh, is built on this edifice of trust in each other. Uh, trust in individuals, trust in news you read, trust in books, trust in uh, companies, corporations and governments. So what happens in a world where you just don't know what to trust? We've already reached a stage today where every time you get a WhatsApp, you first Google to see whether the WhatsApp is true or not true. And so this whole notion of how do you create trust in society in this world, a digitized world of AI, Gen AI, is going to be a really big challenge. I'm convinced that the trust economy is going to be one of the biggest economic opportunities in the coming decade. And how do you create something which people can rely on and trust in? But in the meantime, till we can get to the trust economy, uh, that is yet another risk of this brave new digitized world. Um, so the truth is banks are still relevant. Uh, Bill Gates famously said 25 years ago that you know, banking is necessary, banks are not. 25 years on, banks are still around and pretty much necessary and banks are continuing to grow. Uh, but my view is that as you go forward, what constitutes a bank will continue to vary. It could be people like DBS or State Bank of India or JP Morgan, but it could equally be people like Google and Amazon and Apple. The answer will lie less in how you're regulated. The answer will lie more on how you're able to cater to the customer experience. The people who can reinvent their models, who can reinvent the customer journey, who can create a customer experience that is differentiated, those people will win. And the future of banking in the context, what we are, will therefore be defined by people who can achieve this, leverage data at scale, rather than by the nature of the license you hold. All right, the last section, I'm running um, uh, out of time, so I will touch on a few of this thing, which is, um, you know, where are we going to? Um, and I think the real point is uh, quite simply this, that over the years, the nature of money has always followed technology. Money used to be cowrie shells. Then it became metal. It became gold and silver. Then when the printing press got created, it became paper. And then in 1950, somebody created plastic, so it became credit cards. Money changes with technology. And therefore, already today, the bulk of money, 97, 98% of money in circulation, is actually bits and bytes. So when you transfer money and we send it on wire transfers into the global SWIFT system, it's all bits and bytes. There's no money that physically goes. Nobody's carrying you know, uh, gunny sacks of paper around. What has happened, however, is that at the consumer phase, the nature of money has still been currency, paper, notes, checks. That is changing and will change. It will change because your QR code and your bits and bytes and your mobile phone will make it possible for you to transfer money and be able to create value without having recourse to the old-fashioned notions of money. Uh, I think the blockchain and distributed ledger technology is going to have a really profound consequence as we go forward. Uh, it's been unfashionable in the last two, three years because of crypto winter. But I think the underlying technology is very powerful. And it will fundamentally change the way, not just of banking, but the way uh, the world functions, the industrial structure of the world functions. Um, and we talk to you about really three ways and three fundamental levels where uh, blockchain and digital technology has got the power to change everything. So first, uh, the first level involves uh, a potential to change the back office of the world and to reimagine workflows. Currently, underlying back office processes remain cumbersome, time-consuming, and paper-based. 
Blockchain technology has the potential to transform how we authenticate and record transactions, as well as transfer value or titles. It enables an immutable, tamper-proof, share-registered digital ledger that allows all parties in a transaction to access a single source of truth and eliminates the need for paper-based documents as well as hubs and intermediaries. Remember, today, what is the role of a bank? I exist to tell you how much money you have. I give you a statement saying you got so much money lying with me. The central bank tells me how much money I have. We know that you own a house because the register of society keeps a record, whether this is your house or somebody else's house. But in a blockchain decentralized ledger world, you don't need any of these record keepers because the ledger is available to everybody and will automatically keep track of everybody's ownership at all times. So your hub and spoke model comes into profound question. And because society is the way we architected it, it is so reliant on the hub and spoke model, it then starts calling into question very simple things. Do we need stock exchanges? Do we need banks? Do we need central banks? Do we need registrars of societies? Can you do away with most of the stuff? So while everything is not going to happen overnight, I'll come back to that. But fundamentally, reimagining and rethinking the way work happens, uh, that will happen and that is certainly happening. One of the things that you will see is the program app the ability to program smart contracts. Now, smart contracts means that not only do you have a distributed ledger, but you also program a contract into parts of the ledger saying only if the following happens, then do the following. Which means that the smart contract will also allow people to transact with each other in a if-then kind of scenario. That's got, again, very, very important and profound uh, consequence. In our case, for example, uh, in processes such as anti-money laundering, know your customer, uh, the notion of doing identity verification, uh, compliance, all of these can change very fundamentally through real-time sharing of KYC documents. Trade finance can change completely. In trade finance, documents go from one party to another. Invoice gets generated, bill of lading gets generated, certificate of incorporation gets generated. It goes from the uh, exporter, goes to his bank, goes shipper, and everybody is constantly sending it forward after authentication. Don't need to do any of this because it's all in one ledger, all gets instantly um, uh, authenticated in real time. So that's the first level. The blockchain has the power to change the fundamental process of how work happens. The second thing, though, that the blockchain world and economy is likely to do, already doing it in many ways, I'm convinced that everything of value will get tokenized. Whether it's your house, your painting, your car, your picture. You can create a physical token representation of anything. Frankly, in some ways, we do it today in very select sectors. Um, REITs, for those of you who are familiar, are an example of that. So what is a REIT? You take a building or a large property, you fractionalize it and create instruments. And so if you go and buy one REIT, you own one hundredth of the building. So you already taken and tokenize the building and you distribute it in hundred tokens, if you will. Right? So it's an example. But what will happen going forward is these tokens are all going to be digital tokens. And the power of the digital tokens is one, it can be fractionalized endlessly. So REITs and so on, you've got to buy 50,000 or 100,000 bucks worth. But in a fractionalized economy, you could get 0.0001% of your sari. Right? And you can take that and distribute it around if anybody wants to have a share and ownership in a sari or a painting. Uh, that ability to fractionalize the scale is actually uh, very distinctive. The second thing that you can do is that you can transfer that value and settle for it at the same time. Today, what happens if I want to buy something from you, I take it and then I have to pay you separately. The payment, unless it's a cash transaction, but the payment will go through some other form and sometimes takes you one, two, three days to get the payment. But with a tokenized economy, that value exchange between the actual goods and the payment happens together in real time. It changes the whole payment cycle uh, for the world. And finally, like I said, program pro programmable contracts can be built into these tokens. So it will say, okay, I'm buying this 0.01% of the painting, but if the following happens, then the payment will not go through. Right? So can you imagine a world where the whole payment architecture now rests in these kinds of uh, completely distributed contracts? So today, any money transfer from country to country takes about two days to settle because of corresponding banking systems. With blockchain, the funds can be tokenized and sent in real time to the end recipient. And at DBS, we've launched something like this, a company called Partior, which we've done together with JP Morgan, which is creating a blockchain-based network to do cross-border money transfers in real-time settlements, and we're creating a network to do this in real time. 
uh, in capital markets today you buy shares and then you settle for the share separately you know in the over the uh, counter process uh, in the monetary authority of singapore our central bank has partnered with industry players including dbs on industry pilots involving the successful trading of foreign exchange and government securities uh, against this permission uh, defi liquidity pool it's a blockchain so it happens simultaneously in real time the settlement happens along with the exchange or the bonds deposits of foreign exchange uh, and then in terms of smart contracts so again we did a smart contract pilot last year in singapore along with the government the government agency wanted to give out coupons which were available to citizens to be able to use only for specific things you could use it to go for healthcare or for certain you could go and use it to go and buy alcohol uh, earlier they used to give coupons and they had a very difficult way of trying to make sure the coupons could only be used in certain outlet outlets last year we created uh, what we call purpose bound money and purpose bound money had a smart contract which says built into it was the fact that this money would only work if the end recipient was the healthcare provider that's when the money came alive uh, as an example uh finally uh, there is a, a big question mark on the future of money itself so today by and large money is fiat money it's issued by governments it is not always the case but by and large issued by them but if you look at some of the new forms of crypto bitcoin ethereum etc that's all private money it's issued by private players and it's not a small amount of money there's about 2 3 trillion dollars of bitcoin in the world and so it means obviously people are willing to um, use uh, bitcoin the problem today however is for those of you uh, who done uh, your uh, uh, money paper so money serves three purposes purposes it's a unit of account it's a medium of exchange and it's a store of value today most private money really can only serve the third purpose which is the real store of value it stores value but even that is not a uh, good value bitcoin went all the way from 20000 to 70000 in two years so it's a very volatile store of value it's not even a however the unit of exchange it doesn't medium of exchange it doesn't work Uh, Elon Musk said he would accept bitcoins in exchange for his Tesla, and then two weeks later he changed his mind because the Bitcoin value fell by half. So he didn't know how much money he was actually getting for the Tesla, uh, and therefore private money to be used as real money uh, is, I think, going to be difficult and challenging. I don't see that happening anytime soon. However, there's another form of tokenized money which I think will happen, and those are central bank digital currencies. Already, central banks are actively working on launching a range of digital currencies. both retail cbdcs they call as well as wholesale cbdcs the retail cbdcs have been launched by as many as 11 central banks in different uh, jurisdictions uh, the bahamas east caribbean jamaica nigeria etc where they're trying to create the ability to be able to use digital currency and coin that's not very different from being able to use a phone and a qr code honestly uh, but in those countries where there is a lack of participation in the system and mobile uh, technology is not that prevalent this could happen what central banks are definitely doing is creating things they call wholesale cbdcs which is the ability to create cross border settlement through central bank digital currencies which the banks will exchange in and of themselves several banks today almost a dozen central banks are working on networks to create these wholesale cbdcs which will be used in the interbank uh, space and uh, the last uh, level so i said you know the way the work work the back office of the work can change the nature of money and settlements can change my last comment however and this is uh, the most dystopian the nature of the way the world is governed can change as well uh, what do i mean by that if you read what most of the uh, evangelists the the web uh, defi or 3.0 evangelists would argue uh they would argue that at the end of the day each one of us 9 billion people in the world should be a self sovereign entity each one should be a government of ourselves and each one should have the right to contract by ourselves with anybody in the world and this edifice of smart contracts and a blockchain world will allow us to deal with everybody in this kind of world now if you take this forward of course it means that money in this world could be private and everybody will exchange their own money facebook for a long time tried to come up with their own facebook coin libra they called it uh is the notion that all the 2 billion users of facebook would use this coin to settle among themselves uh what is the problem with this the problem with this it flies in the face of the westphalian system and the nation state because it means you will now have money and a money supply which is not controlled by a government 
it is no longer fiat money. Uh, while the evangelists would argue that this is ideal in a utop utopian world, my own sense is that nation states are a relevant today. They create a sense of community, but most importantly, are not ready to give up control of their economies and the monetary policy anytime soon. So in this kind of environment, while a, a lot of people would argue that you could create a world where the power is no longer in the hands of corporations or governments, power has now been decentralized into the hands of individuals. I don't see that happening anytime soon. Frankly, if you go there, finally you always have people who are orchestrators of the system. There are people called DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations. And there is the school of thought which says that even when you create a completely decentralized world of this sort, the DAOs actually are the ones who are wielding power. So it's not even entirely clear that you get a completely decentralized system in the first place. Uh, nevertheless, uh, as the third possibility in a DeFi decentralized world, a common private currency which rules the world uh, and uh, supplements or, or supplants uh, fiat money by nation states, uh, it is not entirely in the realms of science fiction. So, um, what does this mean for banks? If you do get to a world of this sort where you know everybody is dealing with themselves, you don't need hubs and spokes. You know, everybody people lend to each other, borrow from each other. Um, is there a role for banks and is there a role for bankers um, uh, like myself? Um, it's my own view that even in this system, uh, there will be a role for intermediaries. And to me, the best example is when the world in the 80s, 70s and 80s moved from commercial banking to investment banking. The idea then was the banks would get entirely disintermediated, that companies would issue bonds and equity and investors would directly buy the bonds and equities. And so you wouldn't need banks in between to do the risk and time intermediation. Guess what? It spawned a completely new industry, the investment banking industry. And it created a brief, even bigger than commercial banks whose job it is to orchestrate between the issuers and the investors. In my view, even if you were to look at a decentralized world, you will still need facilitators and intermediaries who will have to play an orchestration role, would have to play a role of being able to handhold and create the guide rails and the guide paths of being able to help people navigate this world. At DBS a few years ago, in this spirit, we created something called the digital asset ecosystem. So we have a capacity to tokenize. We can tokenize anything. We have capacity to trade these tokens, including cryptocurrency. So we have our own crypto exchange. We trade currencies. We have capacity to custodize all kinds of tokens and digital assets. And we're doing all this because we believe that even in this brave new world, there will be a role for intermediaries of this nature who will play these roles to help people orchestrate, navigate, and be able to participate in this new economy. All right, so as I wind down, let me go back to where we started. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Uh, it's clear to me that the fundamentals of banking, uh, the purpose of banking, have remained unchanged and are likely to remain unchanged, which is the ability to help people save, the ability to help people borrow, move money around, and lubricate the wheels of the economy. Uh, but it is also clear from everything I said that this industry is changing at a pace that is unimaginable. It is changing because of regulation. It is changing because of the nature of the players who've come into the industry. It is changing because of the nature of technology and customer expectations. It is changing because of AI and data and the profound consequence it has. And it has the potential to change even more profoundly with a distributed ledger, blockchain, and an entire new world of payments and settlements. Um, in this new world, the destiny of banks is not cast in stone. Uh, but is instead one that can be shaped. Providing convenience and superior customer experience will be the linchpin for players to thrive. Anybody who can create a differentiated and compelling customer experience and able to, is able to remodel the business for that can win. That somebody could be a bank, it could be a tech company, it could be any other player because technology is available to anybody. Uh, will we see a future without banks? Uh, well, like I said, there's a possibility of reimagining an infrastructure without any banks, but I do believe that there is the possibility for banks to continue to exist. The future of banking is thus up for grabs. It belongs to anyone who will embrace technology, who will stay nimble and agile, and place customers at the heart of what they do. Now, I started my lecture suggesting that banking is a lot more than finance. 
and I hope uh, I have been able to give you a sense of that. Uh, but I also was hoping in the course of this conversation to make it a little bit of a recruitment pitch to give you a sense of uh, the possibilities. Uh, you don't need to be a finance geek and you could be one of many things, marketing, data, analytics, psychology, and you could still make a bank a really valuable and cherished home. So to uh, give uh, some of you an opportunity to experience what that is, uh, I'm very pleased to announce that DBS will offer three internships to uh, St. Stephen students uh, to be able to get a sense and experience the reality of banking over summer. Uh, we will come back uh, you know, to you with details through the principal's office. And any of you of your colleagues who are interested in doing such an internship and get a sense for the possibility of what the new world of banking is, uh, I would encourage you to raise your hands and put in an application. Uh, and finally, for those of you who either don't have the inclination or are not fortunate enough to do a stint at DBS, uh, I have some other good uh, news for you, which is uh, uh, just to thank you all for your patience, for giving me a hearing all afternoon. Um, we're going to throw open the cafe uh, for anybody, so all eats and drinks this afternoon are on the house. Uh, thank you all very much, and thank you for hearing. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Piyush Gupta, for what you just shared with us. And I'm not talking about the internships and the free cafe hog. I'm talking about the lecture. What a beautiful lecture it was. I was uh, hanging on to every word you said, even though I come uh, from a non-finance background. Your lecture was thorough, incisive, and wide-ranging, starting off with uh, Paul Gauguin's quotation. You talked about where we are coming from, and then you spoke about where we are, and then you very beautifully asked certain questions which hinge on philosophy, morality, and the future of banking itself. I'm sure all of us have enjoyed listening to Mr. Gupta and uh, what he has shared with us. May I request all of us to stand and give him a standing ovation. And on behalf of all of us, the college, the faculty, especially the youngsters who have been, please be seated, especially the youngsters who have been listening to you, and I am Sure, they have picked up much from what you shared with them. May I request Samir Mabilai to present a small memento from all of us. I'd like to say thank you to the many people who made this wonderful, distinguished alumni lecture possible. But first of all, I'll have to say thank you to Rahul and Samir for having thought of giving back to college in a manner where they continue to support the young people of the college. And so my first thanks goes to Rahul and Samir for thinking of the future of the college and for investing in the MRF St. Stephen's Endowment Lecture. Thank you very much from college. I'd like to thank Piyush Gupta for very willingly accepting to come here and deliver this distinguished lecture. The lecture was not only distinguished, 
It was also something all of us benefited from. And we are very grateful to you for the time that you have given us, for the content and the experience that you have shared with us. We are very grateful for what you have done. Thank you so much. I'm very grateful for all of you who are here, present to encourage the continuance of this lecture series. I know many of you have had to come through very difficult traffic. Many of you have set aside other responsibilities and you've taken time off to come here. But I also want you to know that when you come here, you're also encouraging the college and the little activities like this, which all add up to a huge amount. And that is something we cannot really place a number on. So we are very, uh, I'm very grateful to each one of you for your presence here. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful to a young bunch of volunteers who have been grilled by me and who have very resourcefully been on their toes since yesterday. They have been here. They have made sure that everything is arranged perfectly, everything on the stage, off the stage, in the refreshments that we are going to enjoy. Everything has been very minutely planned and taken care of. I'm very grateful to all of these volunteers. Like I keep telling you, this is a great opportunity for learning, and I'm sure you've learned much in organizing this little event. I want to thank Kevin, Arpit, Feroz, and the team there for the technical support that they have given. I'm sure many of them are listening. Many of our alumni are listening from all over the world. And uh, I'm sure if they are able to listen and enjoy, it's because of the work, hard work, that these young men and women have put in. Thank you very much. Please. Uh, don't forget to step out of the hall into the mess lawns and have a cup of coffee or tea along with some light refreshments. At the cafe. <laughs> uh, yes, I warned Piyush that there will be a riot, but uh, I think he's prepared for that. Before we close, I think there are many of us who are very happy, but especially we are very privileged and honored to have with us Piyush's father and Piyush's mother-in-law here. While all of us are very happy, I think the parents are the ones who are the most happy from all of us, among all of us. And so may I request uh, Mr. Piyush Gupta to honor both of them with a shawl each. I can just, you know, I must say, my uh, both my uh, mother-in-law and my father are uh, academics. They're both doctors. 
Uh, my mother-in-law taught at uh, LSR and Delhi University for the longest time. My father did law in the South Campus, even course. At the time, I did my um, education. I think he was the first person who got a gold medal um, uh, from the South Campus at that time. And he used to put... And then he obviously went on and did his own doctorate. Uh, after he retired from government service, he was actually honorary treasurer for Delhi University for 12 years. So he has a long association with the university as well. And I cannot tell you how proud I am of having such uh, great uh, role models for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. All of us know that we owe so much to our parents so much that we will never ever be able to repay whatever they have given us. And uh, I think this small gesture is also an occasion for us to remember or to actually go back to our parents and tell them how much we owe them. Thank you very much for being here this afternoon. I also must say thank you to a young man there who has been slogging away day and night, enduring sometimes my wrath as well because uh, some things didn't happen and then he would remember to get it done so just one from all of us here thank you very much thank you very much for holding up the alumni office we're very grateful to what for what you do thank you may i now request all of us to step out into the uh, mess lawns on our right and then uh, enjoy the small refreshment which has been placed there.